So back in the olden days, or roughly 2016, there was really only one language for writing Android apps, Java, which has been around since the mid 90s, or roughly as long as I've been alive. Even in those olden days, there were already over 2 billion active Android devices and over a million Android apps, all of them developed with Java. That changed in 2019, however, when Android announced they would not only support Kotlin going forward, but actually prefer it to Java. So what to do with the millions, if not billions of lines of Java already written? At Meta, we decided to convert them all. To date, we have translated the lion's share of our Android code base to Kotlin, mostly without breaking anything, though I'll say more about that later. And I do really mean the lion's share. We've translated over 10 million lines of Java code into Kotlin, and we've touched every major Android app owned by Meta. Except Threads, of course, which was already written in Kotlin. Between newly written and translated code, Kotlin now accounts for more than half of our Android code base. Of course, this begs the question, why not just write new code in Kotlin and leave the older Java be? Why would we take 10 million lines of perfectly good Java code and rewrite them in another language? The short answer is that engineers prefer Kotlin and are more productive in it. Kotlin is both more concise and less ambiguous than Java. I've been working on Kotlin conversions for over three years now, and it's been fascinating to see how changing the language engineers use day to day can make a code base so much more robust. Of course, eliminating ambiguity doesn't come for free, and by translating to Kotlin, we've essentially taken on this task, this enormous task of resolving points of uncertainty across our rather large code base. So over the next 20 minutes or so, I'll describe how we've managed to automate translation for millions of lines of code and drive down that ambiguity as we go. Now I'm just going to talk today about the translation effort that my teammates Jocelyn Jingbo and I have been working on. So if you'd like to hear more broadly about how Meta adopted Kotlin, check out Lisa's talk from Mobile at Scale last year, or Omer and Sergey's post from 2022. My hope is that some of what we've learned will be useful to those of you contemplating large-scale migrations or rewrites, even if it's not targeting Kotlin. To start, I'll go over what our automated conversion pipeline looks like. Then we'll talk about every Kotlin converter's arch nemesis, stricter nullability. And finally, I'll share where we're going next and how you can use some of the conversion tooling we've open sourced and perhaps even contribute. Our conversion pipeline. Imagine, again, that it's the olden days, this time, let's say, 2020. You're converting your code base to Kotlin one file at a time by clicking a button in the IDE the IDE here being IntelliJ, and doing a lot of waiting. And I do mean a lot of waiting. Using the converter button is certainly faster than doing it yourself, but the resulting code still requires a lot of cleanup, and you can't do any other work while you're waiting for the conversion to finish. This is how most of the industry still does column conversions, and that's how we did them too when we started. I actually really thought that this approach would work originally, uh, and disagreed with my coworker Omer about it for months, but eventually, after a lot of clicking and waiting and many finger cramps, I was forced to agree, because clearly this approach just wasn't going to scale for a code base of our size. It might work for pretty much every other Android app in the world, but we would have to click that button and wait and then do manual cleanup almost 100,000 times. That adds up to nearly 100 years of engineering time, and I do not want to be doing this continuously until I retire. So we decided to do conversions in an unusual way. We hacked together a headless version of the IntelliJ IDE's converter, commonly known as J2K, so that we could run most of our conversions on remote machines. We call this conversion tool the Kotlinator. The Kotlinator generates Kotlin conversions that then show up as diffs, just our version of pull requests, where developers can review the changes, make further updates if needed, and then ship the Kotlin code. This here is a real conversion generated by the Kotlinator bot that an engineer then clicked a button to ship. And this is open source code too, so you can actually see this commit in the Fresco GitHub. Not surprisingly, this way of converting is much more efficient and also less error prone than the old approach. And over time, we've really leaned into the belief that you can and should automate anything and everything possible. As a result, the Kotlinator has grown in size to six phases, including the core J2K converter. Running all six phases typically takes about 30 minutes, which is long, but it's done remotely by a bot, so it still saves engineers a lot of time. 
We start with a deep build to help the IDE resolve all the symbols in the file we're going to convert. If you've ever used IntelliJ or Android Studio and wrestled with red symbols, then you know exactly what we mean. Next, we run our custom preprocessing, which contains about 50 steps for things like nullability, as well as changes to support our various custom frameworks. For example, we might add a non-null annotation to certain parameters in litho specs that we know should really, truly never be null. Like here, where we've annotated the resource parameter. Then, after pre-processing, we have our headless J2K, as I already mentioned. It's the same J2K we know and love, just server-friendly. Then, we have our custom post-processing, which is very similar in architecture to our custom pre-processing. It consists of about 150 steps for things like Android-specific changes, more nullability fixes, and other changes to make the code more idiomatic. In fact, here's one example of a change post-processing would make when dealing with Android parcelable creators. This is a pretty common pattern, but it isn't handled in J2K. You can see here that the post-processing phase would make some subtle changes to nullability on the type arguments. Without these changes, the converted code would not build. But with it, full steam ahead. After post-processing, we run our linters with auto fixes. And finally, the colonator makes even more fixes based on build errors. A lot of these phases are pretty self-explanatory, so I'll just dive a little deeper into the interesting ones, starting with headless JTK, and then the pre-processing and post-processing phases. So, headless JTK, in my experience, it was a lot harder to create than it sounds like it would be. It was tricky because JTK is very tightly integrated with the IDE, and not surprisingly, the IDE is meant to be used as an IDE and not as a command line server application. We ended up basically running it as if it were a headless inspection. Uh, if you're familiar with the IntelliJ platform, what I mean is we extended the application starter class and then called directly into the Java to call in action. Until recently though, we never really dove into the IntelliJ code beyond creating the headless converter. We effectively treated J2K as a black box even though it's open source, you can see it right in the JetBrains GitHub. Eventually, though, we realized that no matter how many custom phases we added to the Colonator, we would never be able to fix certain recurring problems that were rooted in peculiarities of J2K, like imports disappearing and then reappearing in unexpected ways. Now, it just so happens that JetBrains was overhauling J2K last half anyway to make it compatible with the new Kotlin compiler. So we tagged along on this adventure and helped them with the compiler compatibility work, as well as just general improvements to J2K. Uh, we actually just started using the new version of J2K for our conversions, and it is looking very nice. So we are very glad that we had the chance to work with our friends at JetBrains, uh, Ilya and Alexi. Now, for the pre-processing and post-processing phases. As I alluded to earlier, most of our custom conversion logic lives in these phases. So we'll dive a little bit deeper into the details now. The goal of these phases is to make the column produced by J2K more correct and idiomatic. You may be thinking, well, correctness makes sense, but why bother with the idiomatic part now? Just save it for later. Mostly because it turns out it's very tempting for developers to make certain idiomatic changes themselves, and they can get them wrong. Like this example, where someone very reasonably tried to collapse the sequence of null checks, uh, but missed a condition in the process, in this case, the uh, is empty. After this bug, we decided to add a step in post-processing to automate this transformation and several others. Even though it's not strictly necessary to make the code compile, it removes some of the human risk factor from conversions. Now, just to make it really clear, the pre-processing and post-processing phases live outside of the IDE and can be easily run from the command line. They're both based on an internal metaprogramming tool that can analyze and edit both Java and Kotlin code. For AST, or abstract syntax tree operations, we use the same PSI libraries that J2K uses. In fact, it's pretty similar to the platform provided by IntelliJ for writing inspections and intentions. Uh, but there are a few important differences that make Editus, this tool, better suited to the scale of our code base and conversions in particular. 
But most important, it is trading always available very fine-grained symbol resolution for greater speed. We need some symbol resolution in pre-processing and post-processing, but we can still get a lot done, even if it's only partially available. Whereas waiting five minutes to resolve a single symbol is a big no-no for us. Our pre-processing, post-processing phases also work on broken code, unlike most metaprogramming tools that are based on compiler plugins. This is especially important for post-processing because it's running right after J2K when the converted code is in a pretty sorry state. Our post-processing steps can parse and analyze the sad broken Kotlin code anyway and make changes so that it can build. We also leverage post-processing and to a lesser extent pre-processing to make changes not just in the file being converted, but also in its dependence. For example, we use it to update external implementers of getters turn properties, like here, where we've just converted the interface on the left, which now has a property called name instead of the old getter. Our post-processing phase would search through thousands of files to find all the Kotlin implementers, like the code on the right, and update them to override the property instead of the getter. We also use post-processing to update nullability in some cases, like this one where we've just converted the interface again on the left, and now we need to make its nullability match that of its Kotlin implementers. Similar to before, post-processing would search through thousands of files to find the implementers and compare their nullability to the interface. The implementers are the source of truth when it comes to nullability, so we automatically update the interface to match. Like here where we've made the parameter bar non-nullable. We're very careful with this though. Note that before I said our goal was to make the Kotlin code more correct and not make it more likely to build. The reason why is that we'd rather produce Kotlin code that doesn't build rather than Kotlin code that builds and then crashes at runtime. Next, let's discuss the joys and the perils of stricter nullability. Now, there are many sneaky ways, like a monster under the bed, to introduce bugs during a conversion. I think we've probably had a brush with most of them in the 40,000 or so conversions that we've shipped so far. But nullability stands out because it's so pernicious and it's the source of most of the ambiguity that we're trying to eliminate. In fact, more precise nullability and therefore fewer null pointer exceptions is one of the primary reasons we're migrating to Kotlin in the first place. But we don't get that improved null safety for free. Let me show you what I mean with an example. Now, on the left, we've got a conversion that looks straightforward, almost a one-to-one -one mapping. Certainly, the two versions of the Foo class look identical, but they're not. If you look at the bytecode, which I've roughly paraphrased on the right, it reveals that the Kotlin version is actually equivalent to the Java code plus an extra null assertion. In other words, the accuracy of the stated nullability is being enforced at runtime in the Kotlin version. In the Java code, however, the code implies that the parameter isn't nullable, but there's no real guarantee. Even if you're using a null checker, like null safe, which is what we use, it's not strictly enforced because it's limited to static analysis. Now, null safe is pretty awesome, and we wouldn't be able to do these conversions at all if the folks on the static analysis team hadn't rolled out null safe a few years ago. But Kotlin provides even more powerful null safety guarantees because it combines static analysis with runtime data. Now, like I mentioned before, this is one of the major reasons why we're migrating to Kotlin and why it's helpful in the long term. In the short term, though, it's a little scary. Because we can't fully trust the nullability annotations, or lack thereof, we're effectively placing thousands of bets each day on the true nullability of every parameter, return type, and field in every conversion that we ship. Often, there are some helpful context clues, like a dereference in the body of a method, which tells the collinator this parameter really needs to be non-null, like here, where we see that bar truly can't be nullable because it's dereferenced. Or, as another example, Say, a method that returns a null literal, which tells the collinator, this return type really needs to be nullable, otherwise it will crash at runtime. But these clues are distributed across the nodes of a dependency graph that is truly enormous in scale. And the most helpful hints may be several dependency hops away, where they are defined. Now, if we choose correctly, no one will ever know we were there. 
but sometimes with conversions we are flying blind. This here is real code that is part of Facebook Marketplace, which I personally converted shortly before July 4th weekend in 2022. I shipped the conversion, went on vacation, and then promptly got COVID. Meanwhile, this code started crashing for alpha and then beta users who were trying to search for items on Marketplace. At the time when this crash happened, we hadn't yet learned the importance of not just treading carefully with nullability, but following that up with monitoring and lots of testing. We learned the hard way uh, to set up a veritable obstacle course to prevent crashes from making it to our users. The first measure and my personal favorite is that we just don't ship source code conversions right before the branch cut. You can ship converted test code all you want, but if the colonnator is touching something that users will see, you may have to wait up to 24 hours to ship it. I know it sounds kind of silly, but it's astonishingly effective. The second measure is our very sensitive, very specific monitoring bots. If we see a crash that affects even just two users in a recently converted file, we flag that crash and create a ticket to fix it with an SLA. Now that's a pretty low threshold considering the size of our user base, but fortunately, most nullability crashes have a very distinctive signature, which makes them very easy to spot and then to fix. And nowadays, most of the time that there's a nullability crash, almost none of them make it to the point where any user outside the company will see them. As for that crash in Marketplace that I caused, the fix was pretty simple. Just make the parameters nullable. The broader fix, however, is a lot more complex. To make our Java code safe for conversion, we've created dozens of complementary code mods with the goal of finding all the parameters, return types, and fields across the code base that are missing nullability annotations and then adding them. These code mods rely on a combination of static analysis and runtime data, just like Kotlin, to determine the true nullability. But even that's not quite enough. When we worked with JetBrains this year to improve J2K, we added extension points at the start and end of the converter to allow clients like Meta to add their own custom conversion steps right inside the IDE's converter. Many of the extensions we're creating are, unsurprisingly, nullability related. The IntelliJ platform offers pretty sophisticated tooling for doing static analysis surrounding nullability. So we're able to leverage that as sort of a measure of last resort right before the conversion happens. And we're still adding more because we still have a lot of converting to do. At this point, all of our major Android apps are more than 50% Kotlin, which is great, but it also means that now we have to do the hard part because we won't get the full benefit of Kotlin's improved null safety until we're well past 90%. And our dependency graph looks like less like this with the mixed Java and Kotlin, and more like this with most of our central actively developed files in Kotlin. We're still leaning heavily on automation. Uh, even now, almost half of our conversions so far have been fully automated, which is to say that a developer need only review and ship the conversion. And we actually hope to increase that percentage even as conversions get more complex. We're also just beginning to see the fruits of our collaboration with JetBrains, and already the Cotinator is making progress with conversions that previously were impossible to automate. We're also starting to collaborate with some other companies who are tackling Kotlin conversions of their own, like Uber and Google, so that we can share all of the pre-processing and post-processing steps that are most useful for dealing with Android code bases. A few of these steps are actually already open source, and that number will only continue to grow. You're welcome to try the tooling yourself or maybe even contribute. We also regularly discuss our progress and challenges on the Kotlin Lang Slack and the J2K channel. So if you'd like to chat, come join us there. Happy Kotlinating, and thanks for listening. <laughs>